the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. Life is full of uncertainty and unpredictability. With so many variables, it's impossible to know anything for certain, except, of course, the certainty of taxes and death. An inevitability for all of us, death occurs all around us, and yet we know so little, if anything, about what follows. To fear one's mortality is to fear what might lie beyond this world. If only we had some way to know what the afterlife was like, some way to see into it, or perhaps some way to communicate with those already there. If only there was a way to talk to the dead. My name is Zenonaki, and in tonight's Spook Stop, we're going to take a look at the various ways people have tried, and supposedly succeeded, to make contact with the other side. The 19th century was a period of significant change throughout Europe and North America. The Industrial Revolution had given rise to new large cities bustling with new jobs, new pastimes and hobbies, new opportunities for success, and unfortunately, new dangers. As horseless carriages raced across the streets and blackened air billowed out of factories, the general life expectancy for city dwellers was on the decline. Moreover, religious congregations weren't as readily available as families were packed together in city high-rises. Direct guidance from the church was weaker in these areas, and those holding on to their faiths were fearing for the well-being of their young ones. The general public was also learning more of foreign cultures. People started opening their minds to new ideas concerning spirituality. Scientist and mystic Emanuel Swedenborg wrote several books in the 1750s detailing his own divine visions and views on the afterlife, while the 1770s saw German scientist Franz Mesmer propose the existence of an invisible force or life energy that permeated through all living things. The fuel for the spiritual movement was building up throughout the century. But the ones credited with sparking it were sisters Kate and Margaret Fox in 1848. Accordingly, the two claimed to have made contact with the spirit of a murdered man whose body was hidden within their home, and communication between them was established through knocking. Now, across the globe, contact with spirits wasn't an unheard of concept. Fortune tellers, soothsayers, and oracles had for centuries claimed to see and hear the unnatural. But their claims were almost completely anecdotal, purely subjective for the seer and the audience would be expected to take their word for it. What largely made the Fox sisters different is that their method of contact, knocking, was very real. The then wiser Americans were seeking evidence for the paranormal, and the phantom tappings and rappings offered just that. While they couldn't see the ghost with their eyes, they could at least hear it with their ears. The pair quickly became national celebrities for their seances, spiritualism had found its foothold. The wave of modern spiritualism reached Europe during the winter of 1852. The practice of seances became popular, where people would gather in small groups to make contact with spirits. And it's here we began to see another new development. Table turning. Participants would gather around a table as they attempted to make contact. Like with the Fox sisters, Knocking or tapping on the table would signal the ghost's presence. In addition, the table may also move erratically, turn or rotate in place, or even levitate off the floor. Investigators Agener de Gaspian and Mark Thury proposed that this was caused by ectenic force, which emanated from the participants. But the knocking and turning in early seances was often restricted to strictly binary responses. For example, knock once for yes, twice for no. While a neat trick, this meant responses had to be hand-picked, 
the spirits couldn't form unique answers. So the act became more elaborate. Participants would slowly recite the alphabet, and spirits would knock or turn the table on the desired letter. Thus, words and sentences could be slowly pieced together. This gave much more detailed accounts, but came with its own flaws. Anyone who has ever had to use a rotary telephone knows how tedious it is to scroll all the way to the end of the rotor just to reach higher numbers. The same is true for the letters at the end of the alphabet. If the ghost wanted to spell out the word pizzazz, participants would be waiting all night. Surely, there had to be ways to speed up the process. Well, there did exist another, more elaborate form of spirit communication, which dated back several centuries. Automatic writing is the process in which a medium or similar would produce written text without conscious effort, allowing outside forces to guide their hands instead. This practice dates all the way back to ancient China with Fuji, aka spirit writing. Here, participants would use a stick or stylus to write Chinese characters in sand. This was also called planchette writing, as sometimes the stick was held in place by a small piece of wood, or planchette, that they moved instead. The practice would find similar parallels in the Western spiritual movement that would later follow, where mediums would enter trance-like states and write out elaborate messages. But this carried the same issues with fortune tellers discussed before in that you had to believe the medium to be telling the truth and not just fabricating a message themselves. When table turning merged with planchette writing, a group of participants would gather around and each place their hand on the small plank, moving together to write out messages. Ingenious, but crude in execution. Long romanized lettering isn't as easy to pull off as the block-like characters seen in Chinese Fuji, so again, there was room for improvement. Luckily, the 1800s saw a new invention sweeping across the Western world which made writing a lot easier. The typewriter. Now the writing of a complex letter or symbol could be simplified to the press of a single button. How could this process be adapted? Spirit typing, maybe? Well, that would again require trust in the medium. Maybe find a way to work in the group dynamic. Planchette typing. Uh, sort of. Requiring no moving parts, participants could slide the planchette around the space of preset letters. Like with the table turning, the ghost would signal which letters to stop on. Hey, doesn't this look familiar? Talking boards had become quite popular among the spiritualist movement, with many variations of boards and planchettes being produced throughout the period. Following the American Civil War, there was a huge boom in people seeking answers about their recently deceased and of course popularity in the boards followed. 1890 saw the first true Ouija board enter production thanks to a handful of people, starting with a man named Charles Kennard. The story goes that Charles, the owner of a novelty company, had the idea for a more standardized talking board. Kennard went on to contact E.C. Reich, a furniture maker and undertaker, and tasked him with constructing the board. The completed board featured the alphabet broken up into two arcs, the numbers 1 through 10 underneath, and the words yes, no, and goodbye. The planchette was also modified, using felt-tipped pegs replacing the previous version's wheels, allowing it to glide more freely. With the completed product ready to be tested, Kennard contacted a Miss Helen Peters, who is a psychic medium and also the sister-in-law of one of Kennard's investment partners, Elijah Bond. Together, the group met and used the board to try and contact the other side. On a whim, they decided to ask the board itself what it wanted to be called. It spelled out O-U-I-J-A. The group then asked what this meant. According to the board, it meant good luck. Helen Peters and Elijah Bond filed a patent for the Ouija board, but like with previous talking boards around the country, they were met with skepticism. The patent officer stated he would only grant their patent if they could perform successfully a demonstration by spelling out his name, information which the pair did not know. But like magic, the board spelled out the officer's name in full, much to everyone's amazement. The patent for the Ouija board was granted in 1891. Bond assigned the patent to both Charles Kennard and his business partner, William Maupin. They wouldn't hold on to it for long, however as the patent was acquired by the Kennard Novelties Company itself when it changed ownership. The new company owner, Colonel Washington Bowie, renamed the company 
the Ouija Novelty Company, and put his partner William Fold in charge. Fold is often credited as being the father of the Ouija board, as he was instrumental in marketing the board nationwide. Bond, too, is credited as the board's inventor, to the point where the board's design is etched into his grave. Kennard's origin story for the board wasn't documented until much later, so it's dubious whether or not he actually invented it like he claimed. Perhaps the true designer of the board is as mysterious as the forces that named it, but more likely these details are simply lost to history. Helen Peters, later Helen Peters Nosworthy after she married, is recognized today as the mother of the Ouija board, the object which continued to play an integral role in her life, for better and worse. When some Nosworthy family heirlooms went missing, Helen decided to ask the board who the culprit was. According to the board, it was one of the Nosworthy family members, information which shocked everyone present. The family quickly divided, those who believed the board and those who didn't. Helen actually fell on the latter category. Helen went on to disown the board and discouraged others from using it, despite its climb in popularity. On her deathbed, Helen claimed, the board tells lies. Things didn't turn out well for the board's other chief inventor, Charles Kennard. As touched upon before, Kennard was kicked out of his own company by its other investors, and through this action he lost the patent. Kennard went on to design a couple more talking boards before the Ouija board company filed a bill of infringement, as they owned the original patent. Kennard was left unable to produce talking boards, and after an unsuccessful marriage, he died after being granted a trademark for Weird A. Exactly what this was is unknown, nothing related to it ever surfaced. As for the then-claimed father of Ouija, William Fold, the board instructed him to build a grander factory to produce boards on a much larger scale, and Fold did as instructed. A massive three-story factory was built. As Fold was supervising the installation of a flagpole on the building's roof, the support he was leaning on gave way, and he plunged off the rooftop. As luck would have it, Fold managed to grab onto the sill of an open window on the third floor, before the window mysteriously shut itself on Fold's hands causing him to continue falling until he reached the ground. Fold managed to survive the fall with moderate injury, namely several broken ribs. While he was being transported, his ambulance hit a bump and one of the broken ribs pierced his heart, causing him to bleed internally and die before reaching the hospital. The suddenness and mysteriousness of this incident only served to bolster the board's reputation, and sales in it grew. Spooky circumstances aside, at the end of the day, Ouija was still just a board game. While it saw booms in popularity during the Civil War, both World Wars, and even outselling Monopoly during Vietnam, expressly because people wanted to contact dead loved ones, Ouija was always held as a harmless party game. Something I neglected to mention was how Ouija seances were outlined to require a mix of male and female participants, which especially helped its climb in popularity during the 19th and 20th centuries, when it was otherwise taboo for young members of the opposite sex to spend alone time together. The board didn't truly gain its sinister reputation until its appearance in the 1973 film The Exorcist, in which the young girl Reagan uses the board and inexplicably becomes possessed by the demon Pazuzu. One of the most successful horror films of all time, this quickly solidified the board's reputation as a dangerous tool people shouldn't play with something the church heavily advocated, and in turn, spiritualism no longer had the hold it did a hundred years ago. I can't end this video without discussing the greatest counter-argument for the board's supposed powers, the idiomotor effect. The idiomotor effect is basically the idea that a person's subconscious is able to affect the minute involuntary motions of the body, Thus, the subconscious may indirectly relay information to us, information we may already know but maybe don't realize. To this end, things like dowsing and divining, pointing to sources of water, work because our body already knows the direction of said water, on some primal, unconscious level. Similarly, Ouija and automatic writing spell out words and information that's already in your head, whether or not it's accurate. For example, during the supposed naming of the Ouija board, 
Helen Peters was wearing a locket of a women's rights activist who went by the name Uida. Thus, Ouija could have been a misspelling or a creation of Helen's imagination. Other forms of seance don't hold water either. Table turning in particular has been debunked not only by the idiomotor effect, but also by many documented ways for practitioners to fake the table's movements. These include foot pedals under the table that induce knocks, or hooks in the medium sleeves which tilt or lift the table. The grip of spiritualism in the West no doubt played a role in the success of the Ouija board, and vice versa, regardless of what validity the board holds as a supernatural conduit. While it's held as being both powerful and dangerous by the superstitious, from its conception it was marketed as a simple party game and toy. While the idiomotor effect succinctly explains the true mechanics of the board, this does not discount the existence of spirits, nor does it rule out their potential influence. For example, many different animals have been shown to hold an acute awareness of natural phenomena well before they take place, such as storms or disasters. And it's commonly held that this sort of attuneness also allows them to detect things like spirits. With this in mind, human sensitivity to spirits and other unseen forces has long been theorized, and this opens the possibility of said forces being picked up on by the subconscious and translated into the board via the idiomotor effect. Perhaps the true mechanics behind the talking board will continue to remain as mysterious as its origins. Have any ideas for future episodes you'd like me to do? Let me know in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, then be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to be notified of my future uploads. Until next time, this has been Zenonaki, signing off.